Monday again I do not have the same energy as I did on Friday but I will do my very best good morning we him it is Monday March 11th we have a great show here for you as usual the news headlines weather report and today in history town elections are near and we have a candidate in the studio this morning mr. Jeff sweat who is running for the school committee he will be sharing about his reasons why he's running and goals if elected. And since it is Monday, you do not even have to guess who is the guest of the day. The Gleason YMCA is back in the building. We'll be speaking with the new program Youth and Teen Director Shayna Santiago about her new job and goals at the Y. Also, this weekend, the Onset Bay Association hosted another great event, the Chili Cook-Off at the Stone Path Malt in West Wareham. We'll, be, uh, we'll have a little video later on to showcase the mood at that event. But first, let's take this moment to thank Not Your Average Antiques, an antique shop down Cranberry Highway in East Wareham for donating the props that you see in the Good Morning Wareham set. So stay with us because the weather, traffic, and the news headlines are next. Except for a few afternoon clouds, mainly sunny today, with high at 49 degrees, low at 29, winds at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Generally sunny on Tuesday with high at 42 degrees and low at 23. Expect normal traffic at Route 3 and 495. The weather conditions are good, so safe travels, everyone. And now to the news. There were a few news stories over the week, and here are the news headlines. <music> Chilly weather goes great with a chilly cook-off. This Saturday, March 9th, 17 chilly uh, cook-off contestants offered up their unique recipes to warm the bellies of the Wareham community at Stone Path Malt. Participants got creative with their stews, giving attendees a variety of flavors to sample. The most creative one included chocolate, lime, and white chicken. Starting at 6 p.m., over 300 guests packed the brewery to test the chilies and voted on their favorite. Some of them had specific rating criterion in mind. And to another news, Wareham Community Gardens are ready and waiting for spring. Though the first few days of March have been cold and snowy, the Wayham Community Gardens are getting ready to spring back into life. The gardens located on Tahanot Road are made of approximately 50 uh, rectangular plots, which cultivators old and new can plant for $35 per season. The garden is open to Wayham residents and residents from neighboring towns as well as schools, groups, and other community organizations such as Boy Scouts. Uh, to kick off the season, the Wareham Community Garden Committee will be hosting several workshops to help gardeners get a uh, feel of the lay of the land. Um, the first of these will be a composing workshop on um, 
sorry, on Saturday, April 20th at 11 a.m., followed by an Earth Day cleanup around the garden at noon. Committee member Hannah Tragus, a specialist in plant physiology um, and educator at Massachusetts Horticultural Society, will lead, will lead the workshop, which is dedicated to the, mem to the memory of onset environmentalist and avid community uh, gardener, Dick Wheeler. And to another news, Richard Wheeler Memorial Fund uh, has been addressed to benefit Wenham Libraries. The Friends of Wenham Free Library has announced the establishment of a memorial fund in honor of onset nat nat naturalist Richard Wheeler to benefit the Spinney Memorial Branch of the Wenham Free Library. In honor of Wheeler's mem uh, memory, the Friends will also purchase a variety of books on environmental topics for both the main library and the Spinney branch. Anyone wishing to donate to the Richard Memorial uh, Fund may do so by sending donations to the Friends of the Wayham Free Library. They may also drop off um, those funds, those donations in person at the main library or Spinney branch. Note uh, Memorial Fund on the memo line. That is all for the news this morning. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. Guess who? Well, it is Monday, which means the Gleason YMCA is in the building. We have got a fresh face this morning, not Lou Brito, but the new program youth and teen director, Shana Santiago. Welcome. Thank you. So, you're a little bit nervous? A little bit. I told you not to be. You see how quick the show goes? It does go very quickly. Okay. So, you are the new program director? Yep. Okay. And this is, this is interesting. You have not graduated college yet. No, not yet. And yet you are able to secure a full-time position. Yeah, it's really exciting. So tell us a little bit about you. Who are you? Where do you go to school? What do you take? Uh, before we get to the tougher questions. Uh, so my name's Shana. I'm from the Wareham community. I grew up in Wareham. Um, I'm a student um, at Bridgewater State University right now. Um, I'm currently enrolled in two classes. I'm taking an online behavioral analysis class and my internship, which the, um, my job at the YMCA is counting as my internship for the semester. So in May, excuse me, in May I'll be graduating with my bachelor's in physical education with a concentration in adaptive PE and motor development therapy. Fantastic. So you got the job through the internship that you did from you know through college well I actually worked at the Gleason YMCA starting in October and on the wellness floor with Lou mm. um, and he saw my resume and he thought that I'd be a great candidate for the position so um, I just double checked with my um, advisors at school that this would work for my internship and it all worked out really well so fantastic yeah. so then you went in for an interview yep. First of all, what did you think your chances were? Did you think like, oh, okay, I'm not going to get it because I do not have a degree yet? That was one of my concerns just because I didn't have a degree and I know that there's a lot of good candidates out there who mm -hmm. would be great at the YMCA who do already have their degrees. But I also felt a little bit relieved knowing that Lou kind of, he really wanted me to have this position and he was the one who recommended me to apply for it. So. Fantastic. Yeah. So what do you do at school? Do you just say, no, 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 I got a job. <laughs> um, so I actually am not on campus this semester. Okay. All my classes are online. So 
I don't really have the opportunity to do that. Not that I would do that, but... Did you post on social media yet? Yeah, I did. I, I let my family and friends know that I got this position. So a lot of my friends from school are actually really excited for me and happy for me, so... Nice. Well, congratulations. Thank it's you. something that I didn't do, and wow. You know, I need to grab a page from your manual once in a while. So you're going to start this position once you graduate from Bridgewater State, which is this year. Yeah. Um, and so what are you hoping to bring to the Y? Um, so being from this community, I just really wanted to get the youth programs back to what they used to be. Um, the, the Gleason YMCA used to have a, a lot of youth programs. Not that we don't now, but um, just a different variety. Right now we have a lot of sport and physical activity programs, which are, which are a great thing to have, but um, there's still some people in the community that I think that we could reach even further, whether it's um, music programs, art programs. Um, I come from a background of working with kids with disabilities, so um, I used to work at two other camps in the area, and I want to bring some of the activities I did there to the Gleason YMCA. Um, so that's really what my goal is right now, just to kind of branch out and reach other populations of the community um, and make sure we're all being very inclusive and, you know, serving the diverse community of the Wareham community. Now, you are from the town of Wareham. Yep. You grew up here. Mm -hmm. Did you go to Wareham Public Schools as I well? Did. So you have a broader understanding and in-depth understanding of um, what this community is like. Um, based on that knowledge, what could you, what do you think this community needs that the Y can provide? I think what the community needs is more activities just for after school activities because I know a lot of our kids from the community come in and play basketball but there are some kids who don't play basketball or don't want to go sit in the gym after school so kind of creating more programs to serve that after school population so from three to seven having more activities for the kids um, to participate in and I know the youth and government program was really big in Wareham and I really want to get back to starting that up again so hopefully by next fall I'll have the youth and government program run up, back up and running. Now you, you, you alluded to this in, in the beginning your, your um, unease, your fear of going into this job without the experience right do you still feel that way or you feel like they're providing you a lot of training or are you going to be under somebody's shadow? Um, so right now lose my direct supervisor okay. and he's been a great help just kind of giving me a hand and showing me the ropes a little bit because I the only thing I'm not really familiar with is you know the logistics part of the position because I've worked at summer camps and worked with kids and I used to be a program specialist at other places so I have a good idea of planning programs and implementing those programs and working with the youth but the only th I just had a little bit of a setback working with mm -hmm. the logistics positions so okay um, but everybody at the Gleason YMCA has been really really helpful and um, directing me and how to do those things. So I, I think I've got a, a, a much better handle on it than I did initially when I started. So, Fantastic. So remind us again what, you t what you're taking in school or what you're going to be graduating with. Um, my degree will be in uh, a bachelor's in physical education with a concentration in adaptive PE and motor development therapy. And why did you decide to just study that? When you were younger, Shana, did you say, I want to do what you're going to be doing yeah. now? Um, my, so my mom, she has always been a teacher, and I, that's what I wanted to go to school for initially, is to be a teacher. And then in high school, I was a member of the Best Buddies program, so that's where I kind of found my niche working with people with disabilities. And then um, I went to Bristol Community College for two years just to get my general classes um, done there before I transferred to Bridgewater. And during that time period, I spent two summers in Indiana at Bradford Woods, which is a a summer camp for kids with disabilities. It's a recreation therapy based camp. So there is where I kind of found that this is what I really want to do. Um, my second summer I served as the adaptive sports specialist there. So I kind of got to get my feet wet before I actually started my classes getting more into the topic of adaptive sports and adaptive mm. programming. And that's where I really fell in love with it. And I just loved working with the kids and it was really rewarding for me and really rewarding for them to see that if you really work hard, you know, it can really improve someone's quality of life, and that's really what made me want to do what I do. Wonderful. Now, what do they teach in regarding to adaptive um, sports in college? What does that entail? So a lot of our classes for physical educators, we have to take, you know, like an anatomy and things like that. Um, but my concentration specifically, we have a couple classes where we actually get to, you know, play team sports that are adaptive sports, so we kind of 
know what the what the sports like when we're going to teach it and um, so I took a couple classes actually um, one of my classes about working with people who have chronic health impairments and things like that so um, I kind of had a I already had the experience working at the camp I worked at, so these classes I kind of got to help my, my fellow peers and point out some games that would be a really great fit for working with the diverse population that we would be working with. Fantastic. So you love the Y, you have been working with the Y for some time, you're almost graduating, things are coming into fruition for you. Yeah. Um, any fears along the way? What's your take of all this? You're growing up so fast. I'm a little nervous for graduation, <laughs> but it makes me feel, I'm, I'm a little more at ease knowing that I already have a position. Oh my God. So yes. it's, that's my, that was my biggest concern back in September is I'm graduating in a year what am I going to do after graduation? I can't work at summer camps my whole life, and I guess now I actually can, so it's, <laughs> it's pretty nice to be able to do what I love. And, Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. And I know, I mean, one of my biggest concerns, just as how what you mentioned of graduating and you do not have a footing anywhere else. You have to go yeah. out there. And I felt this sense of entitlement that once I have my degree, it should open any door for yeah. me. Did you feel the same way? Um, I kind not to, not to brag, but I kind <laughs> of did feel that way just because I have a lot of experience doing what I do. And I've had a lot of other job offers, not to this degree, not, mm -hmm. as, um, not as a big position like this, but um, just working at other community area in the community and surrounding communities. So I wasn't entirely nervous, but uh, just a little, I was just a little apprehensive um, because I know a lot of people don't. I have a couple of friends who've had like 70 job interviews and didn't get any of them. So Absolutely. And I was, was like, that's probably going to happen to me. So it's just a little... It's, it makes me feel really good that I don't have to really worry about that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I am very, very um, you know, happy for your success. Thank you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you to get to see the programs that you implement. And summer is coming, so I'll be seeing you a lot outside. Okay. Fantastic. Awesome. Anything else that you'd like to add that I didn't ask? Um, and one thing I'm actually working on, which might be of some great information for everybody, mm -hmm. but we have our youth basketball league and we're starting our second session up um, in April and I'm working on hopefully, this will work out hopefully, um, to add another age bracket. Because right now we're working, um, we have a five to seven and then an eight to 12 league and I'm trying to get a 13 to 16 league going. So I don't know if it's going to happen, but that's kind of a big project I'm working on right now, so. Fantastic. Yeah. Good. You're out there and, you know, you're working at the same time you're getting your workout on. Yeah. Th that's the best position I, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Not the nine to five job, right? Yeah. You're in there when you're needed and you're in there even not when you're needed, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. So that was the new program youth and teen director, Shanna Santiago. Bob? <laughs> Uh, talking about her new position at the Y and her goals. Moving on, last Saturday was very chilly, and so to warm up, the Wareham residents gathered at the Stone Path Malt in West Wareham for some chilly. <laughs> The, uh, the venison is local from a deer that I got in the fall. So, um, yeah, and then the, the pork that's in there is ground and that's from a local farm from a friend of ours. Everything is pretty much all organic. Um, we have all compostable uh, cups and uh, spoons. We're very uh, environmentally conscious. And um, I don't know, I just tried to put as many chilies in as that I could. Uh, I didn't want to make it too spicy. And how do you differentiate, or what do you think will really differentiate your chili with others that are showcased that we're here today? Um, it's, it's very meaty. It's, not, it's spicy, but it's not hot. Um, I believe you go for the flavor. You can always make it hotter by putting in hot sauce or something. So I make it 
try to make it spicy with a little little bite to it and um, that way there anyone can enjoy it. So whose recipe are we featuring today? How did you guys make this recipe? The original was um, uh, Captain Roly, that's uh, Chief now, Chief Roly. Uh, myself and a couple others came up with a recipe and um, it's been a success ever since. And what say, how does, does your chili differentiate itself from other chilies that are hosted here today? It's mostly hearty, you can taste all the flavors, and then at the end there's a bite. It's not just a hot or sweet chili, it's got all flavors. So it has the personality of the Wayham department. That's right, <laughs> it does. When do you get time to fight fire when you're creating this chili? In the, in the, in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can have the beer, Stephen. Are you of middle age? Of course I am. Okay. Should That's I show it. you my ID? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Tell me about today's event. Did you have fun? So, I haven't actually been to Stone Path before. I've heard it was kind of new and really wanted to come. Excited from the second I walked in, seeing how big this place was, okay. understanding the side of the business behind where they go with the brewery stuff, you know? They're the malt behind the breweries. Yeah. So it was cool to actually see that side of the business, because all you see nowadays is breweries. So right? what brought you here today? Was it the beer or the chili? It was a friend who showed me on Facebook <laughs> the event uh, that worked out well, and it was a chili fest. I came down from Boston. Today was... A wonderful day. We actually had so many people, we had them lining up outside to get in because we were at capacity. And this is for Onset Bay Association, which is a 501 nonprofit. We put on over 30 events through the year and we're delighted with the turnout. And I made chocolate chili, dark chocolate chili. It's good for you. We came to support the Onset Bay Association. Um, the chili contest was uh, a great opportunity for us to support our community. Uh, we came with a vegetarian chili because we are the Y and we're all about healthy living. And we came with a beef and uh, linguista chili because it's chili. The reason we started doing this this time of year is because there's not a whole lot going on. Um, it's after the Super Bowl. Um, we're getting ready for spring and the weather's not so great, so why not get together and raise some money for all the events that we're running? Because in order to put on, you know, 30 family-friendly, free, low-cost events every year, it, it costs us a lot of money to put those on. So this is a fundraiser to help the OBA with the, any associated costs. Another great event and a successful one hosted by the Onset Bay Association, the Chili Festival here at the Stone Path Mart. Reporting from West Wareham, I am Queen Banda of WCTV. Hello and thank you for being with us this morning. We are broadcasting live from our WCTV studio in Wareham. This is Good Morning Wareham, your source for local news, weather, traffic, and more information. And now for a moment in history. Let's take a look at where we were today in history. In 1818, this day in history, 21-year-old Mary Shelley had her book, Frankenstein, published in, in 1818, thought of by many to be the first science fiction novel, um, the now classic story tells of Dr. Frankenstein who creates a monster. The monster goes on to wander around looking for a friend 
but later on becomes violent in part because of its hideous appearance. Uh, the story has been retold in a countless number of movies and many in the realms of horror and science fiction have been inspired by Mrs. Shelley. In 1888, they say March comes like a lion and out like a lamb. Well, in 1888, the Northeast was hit by one of the worst blizzards in, the rec in, the, in recorded history. More than 400 people were killed and snow totals in some places reached to 55 inches, that is four and a half feet. Um, to make things worse, the winds were as bad as a hurricane, reaching 85 miles an hour. Um, 15,000 people were stuck on trains that were above ground since the snow blocked the rails, and hundreds of boats along the uh, coast sunk. So next time when we get a bad storm, just be thankful that we have trucks to plow. And it's a tradition here, we are talking about birthdays. Today in 1952, Douglas Adams was born. He is known best for his series, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a science fiction comedy saga that follows the last earthing Arthur Dent on his adventures through time and space right after the earth is blown up to make way for an intergalactic highway. The stories are loved by many and a film based on the first book was made in 2005, four years after Douglas Adams' death. Another icon in the comedy was born on this day in, in 1895. Shemp Howard, brother of Curl and Moe, is often thought of as the fourth member of the comedy troupe, um, The Three Stooges. Uh, with nearly 200 acting credits, Shemp may not be the most popular of the group, but he was certainly loved for his antics and remembered fondly to this day. And happy birthday to everybody celebrating their big day today. That is all I have for today in history segment. To learn more about cool historical facts, please go online under history.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The coffee segment is next. But first, let's take a look at our events calendar.
back. You're watching the Good Morning Wayham Show. Oh, we're broadcasting live from our WCTV studio in Wayham at 505 Main Street. This is the coffee segment. With me is Jeff Sweat, one of the candidates running for the school committee a two-year seat. Welcome. Thank you. So, Jeff, where should we start? There's so much about you, and especially about this election. Okay. So let's start <laughs> with what everybody else is thinking and would like to ask you. Okay. How can you explain the mix-up? It's actually pretty simple. Okay. Um, I requested a three-year seat. Um, I signed a paper asking for a three-year seat. Um, when the actual nomination papers were typed up, because they're manually typed up, um, I signed it um, and didn't look to see what was typed. So as anybody who's ever done work on a typewriter or a word processor now, um, it's almost impossible to proof you read your own work. Um, I know I can't, uh, which is why I'm constantly giving it to my wife and say, would you please read this? Uh, but in this case, the assistant town clerk made a mistake, and it's my responsibility to proofread with somebody else, because that's what, that's what people do. That's what an editor is for. That's what my wife does for me. Um, and uh, I didn't. And so I got everybody to sign those nomination papers, and uh, it said two year instead of three year. Now, I don't think it made any difference to the people who were signing them, but legally it made a difference. So once the deadlines had passed, and especially once the, uh, the um, absentee ballots were sent out, it was really too late to do anything about it. Okay. Is this, uh, is this just happened only that day? Do you often read in the past? Because you have done I, these elections in the past. Can, I confess, because this is the fifth time mm -hmm. that I've done this, I didn't even think about reading it okay. to see if it was correct because I knew I'd requested three years and I just assumed the nomination papers would reflect that. So it was an innocent mistake and I failed to, to look and see if it had been done correctly and that's life. That is life. Okay, so you have decided to run for the two-year seat now. Yes. So that leaves Mary unopposed? Yes. Okay, so in the two-year seat now it's pretty crowded. <laughs> there are three of you. Yes, that's true. Okay, and what's your take on your fellow uh, candidates? I had, well, the first thing is I admire the fact that they're out there, you know, wanting to uh, contribute to the town. That was my goal uh, when I uh, came off the finance committee. I was on the finance committee for six years, uh, which is the maximum you're allowed to be on. And I looked around to see if there was something interesting that I could do that uh, I thought my experience and my, my uh, career would help and the school committee was by far the, uh, the thing that attracted me the most. Um, so I admire the fact that they're doing that. Uh, candidly, um, I am lucky because when I was, have been on the school committee, I've been retired, so I had a fair amount of time to, to do things behind the scenes, so to speak, not just show up for the meetings. Um, but I believe both of these uh, uh, young women are, are still working. So it's particularly hard for, for hard for them. So I admire them that much more. Okay. So w let's go back to when you said what attracted you after spending six years in the finance committee was to join the school committee. What about it? What did you seek to change then? I don't think I had a particular, I didn't have an agenda to change something. Um, I had spent most of my career in healthcare management. Um, and, but I had, did spend two years running a charter school management company. And that was my first introduction to education directly. Um, all of us think we understand education because we've been a student, right? So we clearly understand education. Well, it's a whole lot more difficult and complex than that. Um, so I got my feet wet, so to speak, with, uh, with education for two years in charter schools. I didn't know anything about education, and I certainly didn't know anything about charter schools. Um, I, it was a job. It looked interesting. After the fact, 
I don't, I'm not really a supporter of charter schools, but that would take the rest of your show to explain, okay? Uh, well, I not, <laughs> no, because that is interesting. The fact that you worked for charter schools, yes. um, and here in Wareham, we are struggling with school choices. Uh, the whole nation, people are divided when it comes to charter schools, right? And you say we only understand education because we were students. Yes, or but parents. It, or parents, but right. it's way more complicated than yes. that. So, not to take the whole 30 minutes of our program, Jeff, <laughs> but <laughs> what is your understanding? What is that broader understanding that most people are shielded from? Well, public education, a, a guaranteed right in our Constitution, um, was designed to be precisely that, uh, educate everybody um, that is entitled based on age and basically that's the only entitlement, right? Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have, anything else, um, you're entitled to a high quality public education, especially in Massachusetts. As a matter of fact, that, that whole issue was resolved um, long, uh, long ago. In the early 1990s, uh, the whole funding for public education uh, was changed because it was felt depending on where you what community you were in you were getting a better education and mm -hmm. that was uh, considered by the courts to be violating the Constitution of, of Massachusetts over the over the decades there has been uh, an increased concern about quality of education across the country uh, and the perception was and this caused both school choices as well as charter schools to occur the, the feeling was that parents should have more choices. The problem with that, even though it sounds perfectly wonderful, right? Choice is a good thing. Um, and of course, if you have, if you have um, wealth, you can always send your child to uh, a, a, an independent private school, right? Uh, the problem with that is there are, just as there are a wide variety of students in a school in terms of their ability to learn, there's also a wide disparity um, among parents and, and their attitude towards education from those people who don't think it's that important, from those thing, people who think it's the most important thing in the world. And of course, neither extreme is great, right? If you're pressuring your kid to make sure they get an A every single time and the first time they come home with a B, that's, that's intense pressure and that also can be bad for a child. But the point is that the people who chose uh, to go to a charter school, or for that matter, the people who choose school choice, they're actively involved parents. And so that means that disproportionately, the people who leave are the higher, higher achieving students because they have parents behind them saying education is important. And that's why when you compare especially charter schools to regular public schools who take everybody, it, it doesn't make any sense. The comparisons are really, frankly, quite meaningless. And I say that as someone who used to run charter schools. Absolutely. They take the cream of the crop. Well, and on top of that, what yes. some people don't realize is that if you get one student, one of your children, into a charter school, let's say there's a lottery and they win, okay? The sibling doesn't have to go through the lottery. So the sibling automatically gets the opportunity to go to that charter school. So that reinforces the whole thing that it's not a, an ac whatever happens in that charter school is not an accurate represent representation of how good that charter school is. Okay. So back to school choice. And so you're saying parents who either do school choice or take, uh, apply for charter schools, they are active parents. Yes. So what and I, by the way, I applaud them. <laughs> what can we do to keep these acting parents satisfied in our current schools because we are losing students and the funding goes with them and we have to look at our budget, revise, revise our budget constantly, cut positions because of this, because of school choice, which is parents' choice, which they have every single right to do so. But how can we engage those parents? It's one of the better questions that ever, that's ever been asked of me. Um, and it's also an extremely complicated question. There is, those people who are in business understand that the last thing you want to do is become a commodity. And by that I mean that it doesn't matter what people choose, 
okay, when they go shopping, you know, they're all the same, okay? Could be a Kleenex, right? Does it matter what brand of Kleenex you buy? Or does it matter what brand of paper towel you buy? So any business tries to differentiate itself from another company. So the first thing we have to do, and I think we've done a great job of it, is differentiate ourselves from other public schools. Uh, why do I think we've done a great job? I was just at the eighth grade orientation. Now, it's less important now because the eighth graders are in the high school, uh, but the syllabus, the classes, the curriculum that we offer now at the high school, which is where the big change occurs, the high school has shrunk more than any other uh, of our schools, uh, I would say it, it is almost impossible to find that kind of course selection and choice almost anywhere else, um, certainly on the South Coast and the Southeast. Why, why do I say that? Because not only do we have um, international baccalaureate programs, by the way, if those people who think it wasn't worth it, I'm going to let the superintendent announce this, but there is, there is a student who's going to benefit sign, excuse me, significantly financially as a result of the fact that she's probably going to get an international baccalaureate diploma. But I'll let the superintendent talk about that when the time comes, because she and Dr. Schwamm were the big movers behind getting international baccalaureate. But international baccalaureate is almost unique. The only place you can get that around here is Sturgis Charter School. But at the same time, we're also offering a whole slew of, of advanced placement courses. So both international baccalaureate and advanced placement, and then a ton of really interesting electives from cooking to journalism to DECA, the DECA business program. There's just anything you want to accomplish, anything you're, any interest that you've got, you can find at Wareham High School. So and that's, yet that's we are what, well, I haven't finished, okay? Uh -huh. Okay. You asked a tough question, so let me give you a full answer, okay? So first thing we've done is to differentiate ourselves. Mm -hmm. The second problem is the most difficult. I've had, I've had kids say to me, because I coach the tennis team and I interact with kids all the time, you know, coach, I really do not want to go to classes with kids who don't want to learn. So the big, one of the biggest reasons that parents think they should take their kids out and put them somewhere else is because if their child comes home and says, you wouldn't believe what happened in class today. And yes, maybe a kid acted out. Maybe there, there was inappropriate things that happened in a classroom. And parents say, well, do I want my child to have to interact with students who don't want to learn? But the truth is, that's the nature of a public school. Everybody gets to come and be educated. If we don't want that child in that school, too bad. If a charter school doesn't want that kid, they just say, You're, it's not working out. You know, I think you ought to find another place. Well, they can always go back to Wareham Public Schools, Wareham High School, because by law we have to take them. So parents need to understand that if you're a public school, that there are going to be a wide disparity of kids as well as a wide disparity of parents, okay? And some of those kids will desperately want to be there and earn scholarships and have a great career and go on to college, et cetera. And other kids are really frustrated and really don't want to be there, okay? And yes, they have a right to drop out at age 16, but that's a terrible choice, I and mean, you and I both know that. But we can't do anything about the fact that those kids are in a public school. So parents need to understand that. Now, in high school, there are IB courses, there are AP courses, there are honors courses. All of those tend to bring kids who are serious about achieving and learning, okay? So that's the good news. Now, I don't want to make it sound like these kids who don't want to be there are bad people. They're not. The other problem is that they have been frustrated by the fact that perhaps from grade school, they really didn't, were frustrated with their inability to learn. So the other big thing that we have to do, and I think we're slowly getting there, it's really, really difficult, and frankly, the education world hasn't figured this out. I don't mean Wareham, I mean the whole country. There are places all over the country, especially inner cities, that 
haven't figured out how to educate low-income children who literally come to kindergarten and have no clue about how to even hold a book or to their letters or anything else. I was competing with my sister who was two years older than I am, is two years older than I am. Remember that, Diane, you're two years older, okay? Now it's not good to be two years older, right? Um, but because if she was reading, I wanted to read, okay? But if, if you have a, a family environment in which reading is not important and you get to kindergarten and you didn't have the opportunity to go to preschool, preschool should be universal. It's not. Only it still costs money to go to preschool and unless you're a special education student, which more than half of our preschool kids are, okay, you don't get the opportunity to go to preschool. So you can literally get to kindergarten and not know anything about learning. The difference between that and a child that has been exposed to reading from the, maybe from the time they were three years old is huge. So they literally start out behind the eight ball and then they never quite catch up. So by middle school, where adolescence is tough enough, they're really, really frustrated. And, they, and they, every year, they're more frustrated until they're just dying to drop out. So you, you mentioned a lot of things there. Yes, I'm I did. I try to remember all of them. You talked about most, the one that really strikes out to me is um, discipline and parental, um, parents taking, um, playing a major role in, the, in their yes. children's lives, right? So if we are stuck, with both students, well, if we're stuck with students who do not want to be there due to whatever is happening at home or in their own lives, um, and we do not, we cannot let go of them, then should we reinforce more disciplinary measures? And should we hold parents accountable from early age that though we're a public school, we are not going to tolerate with anything below exceptional? You do not have to be an exception student, but just even to behave and act right. Should we give our teachers all the ammunition they could get that this is your classroom and you need to reinforce law? Yes. But keep in mind, when you say enforce the law, the state understands that it's really easy to say to a child who's acting out, and they may not be a bad child. They're just really frustrated and they're just acting out. Um, it's really easy to say, you're expelled, okay? We've gone through the process, goodbye, okay? The state does, does not want that to happen. So it is actually very, very difficult to have a child removed from a school. Also remember, the vast majority of our kids want to be there. It only takes a small percentage, 10, 15 pe uh, students, to create a lot of havoc in a school of hundreds of kids because just the process of acting out, it impacts the halls, it impacts the classrooms, it takes the time of the administration. It can be very disruptive and yet it's a tiny percentage. Now, having said that, I believe that Tracy Cote, uh, who is now responsible for a seventh and eighth grade at the middle school, has probably done a better job of doing that than any principal we've ever had at the middle school. The teachers tell me that. Everybody who works in the school tells me that, and, and, and parents, I think, um, are starting to recognize that there's been a change. It's taken a lot of effort to make that happen, but you're right. Teachers need to su be supported when there's a problem in a classroom. The enforcement needs to be fair and just, but clear, and parents need to be involved because when, when the child uh, they get a call from the principal and says, your child is making it really difficult for other students to learn. They need to take it really seriously. Okay. At least when I was in school, if that ever happened to me, it was never the teacher's fault. It was always my fault. And look where you are today because <laughs> of that mindset. We have 10 minutes, Jeff, so we should get down to your uh, current... Um, uh, why you're running. So tell us why you want to run this time again. You ran the last year, you lost your seat. Yes. How are you feeling coming back? Well, of course, I'm on the school committee again for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. uh, happy to be there. Um, the surprising thing about being a school committee member is when you initially get on, you think that you're going to be able to have more impact than you actually do. 
Uh, the reason is because as of the early 1990s, uh, the state basically said, we don't trust school committee members to be involved in education. Um, surprising, right? But that's literally what they said. So they empowered the superintendent and the principals in different ways to be able to run the schools. And they can ignore the school committee member anytime they want to. Now you may say, well, aren't you the boss of the superintendent? Yeah. You hire them and you can fire them, although they have to get a three-year contract. So it takes three years to fire them if you don't like them, right? But the truth is that some people will appreciate that this. Superintendents are almost like NBA coaches, right? You can't fire the team, so you fire the coach, right? There's lots of jobs you know, out there for superintendents. The average tenure for, for a superintendent is three, four years maybe, okay? The, so if they get fired, it looks on their resume like, well, everybody gets fired in that job, okay, so no big deal, and they, and they get another job. So it doesn't really help to hire and fire. Uh, what really helps is if you can privately, now I'm going to get to the word why I said privately, privately use your background to provide good advice about the things that you observe about what's happening in the schools at, the, at 100,000 feet. I don't mean in the individual classrooms, but the big picture. What what's, could be changed about the big picture? And if you do that privately, and it's a good idea, then you can start to have an impact. So the first thing I learned after about three or four years was focus on privately having a positive impact on how the schools are run at the highest level, not at the individual classroom level. The second thing I learned was the federal government has almost no power. They dangle money around. Um, half of it tends to go to the state, and then the state gives out the rest to the cities and towns. But the federal government basically has no control of what happens in the schools. Locally, there's, the school committee has very little control over what happens in the schools. The policy for manual, for example, all the important policies, they're written by the state. So yes, you can have your own individual policies for things that are relatively small in, in, in importance, but the really big ones like harassment or bullying or all those sort of things, they're all written by the state and you, and you have to use them. So the real power is at the state. So if you really want to have an impact in, as a school committee member, you, you have to get involved at the, at the, certainly at the regional level and at the state level. I never really loved going to Marlboro on a regular basis to be a member of the board of directors of Mass. <laughs> My wife used to say, you're going all the way to Marlboro again? Yeah. Right? But the truth is, that was the only way I really got to, have an, uh, got to impact the state legislators. And as the chair of District 7, which is the Cape and Islands, we met with uh, the legislators annually to say, this is what you're not doing for us as a school district. Um, and I also uh, met the uh, new commissioner of uh, education, Jeff Riley. I've met Secretary Pizer. Um, I, w I was frankly particularly impressed with, um, with the new commissioner, less impressed with the secretary. Why? Because he's so focused on school choice and uh, charter schools, and I don't think he understands the implications for why those aren't good for the community. So you're saying that though everybody, and I met with now will be all the candidates running for this school committee, um, except for Mary, who is already in the school committee, the two new ones, April and Jennifer. They have great resumes and qualifications to be there. But what you're saying is the perception of what you will get to do there is different from the reality due to the balance of power that's correct that is created there so the number of decisions that you make yeah as a school committee member the vast majority of the votes are unanimous about the only thing you you argue about are the superintendent's contract and how much she should be paid and things like that but almost every other decision even the budget because the budget has never has any extra money mm. so if we had extra money and we thought how should we use that extra money we don't have extra money. Uh, um, so we have five minutes, but sorry. I would like to get us this. I would like to get this question in, um, and that is regarding the school buses. Somebody wanted to know more of. I know that the town. We have always 
owned the school buses. Um, but is that a, is, is that system working? Should we revise it? It is working. Okay. Multiple times over the last decade, we have gone out to bid. Um, they're always more than we're spending. We spend now about 1.8 million on school busing, um, and we'd be well over two million if we put it out to private bus companies. The biggest reason for that is, a, is an obvious one. Uh, we're not trying to make money when we own it. It's just the department of the town and the mm -hmm. schools. Uh, privates, they're all private companies that mm -hmm. are out there, and they, they have to cover their costs, and they have to make a profit. Okay. So w we don't have to worry about that. Uh -huh. uh, it's also a bit of a trap. Uh, many school districts have found that they've gone private, and then a few years in, they discover, gee, they're raising prices, but they've gotten rid of all their buses. They've gotten rid of all the people who used to run the buses, the drivers and the and people like like Jamie and Vanessa who are, who are at the uh, and do a lot of other things as well, who are running the transportation department. So it's almost impossible for them to get back into the business, and now they're trapped. And every time, every time they want something extra out of this, out of this transportation department, that's money. Yeah. Okay. Whereas we just we just say to the school department, we need a bus for the basketball team to go to Boston to, you know, to uh, to compete in a playoff, for example. And you get a bus. And we ask for a bus. We get a bus. So, Jeff, for our last question, and we have, I think, down to two minutes, what are you bringing to the table that Jennifer and um, April is now bringing in? Why you this time around? I have relationships throughout the state, um, and I have a strong working relationship with the superintendent and the assistant superintendent and even the principals, and frankly, I even... Um, on a first name basis with the department heads because my philosophy is I should know everybody that's going, that's providing education and, and is making the decisions about what happens in the schools. Can I go up to any of those people and say, you should do this? No, I can't. But I can plant seeds. I can whisper in their ear, have you thought about this? And if it's a good idea, because we have a mutual respect and that's critical, then I think they would take it seriously. Uh, if it's a bad idea, they just tell me, Jeff, it's a bad idea. You don't understand. Yeah. But that's okay as long as I have their ears. So it's the experience of know how you can have a positive impact that I would, didn't understand when I first became a school committee member, and I didn't realize how long it would take to become effective. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being with us this morning. It's been you my pleasure. are full of information. This segment was not the right segment for you. We should bring you back next time. It would be my pleasure. Fantastic. So that was Jeff Sweat, one of the candidates, one of three candidates running for the two year seat for the school committee. And he is, yeah, as you heard from him, he has years of experience. Uh, connections that will foster a better environment for our students and continue to fight the good fight. So, so far, you have heard from everybody except for April Rossi, whose interview will be coming out on Wednesday. Thank you, Wayham, for joining us this morning. If you had missed us this morning, this episode will re air this evening at 6 p.m. I do not have a show next Wednesday because I will be away, but we will replay one of the Good Morning Wareham episodes. Uh, so thank you, and I wish you all a wonderful morning.